So uh, while people are sure in, um, let me go ahead and, and, and start uh, start the. So uh, it's a real pressure. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Marco Avery here today. Um, so Marco did his PhD studies in CSN Italy, uh, and then he spent three years in Chicago as a KICP fellow, and he's now a postdoc at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Marco's one of these people that, that just knows a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, so chances are, whatever you're interested in, you can probably talk to Marco about it. Uh, but but he he's spent a lot of time working on uh, dark energy and modified gravity and evaluating the tensions that we may or are may not be seeing in current in current uh, cosmological data sets and thinking about how they could be resolved. Uh, both in terms, again, of modified gravity, but are also looking at things like neutrinos and things like that. Uh, so so it's, it's really a broad range of things, and I'm guessing the, the, the talk is actually gonna touch on a lot of these things today. Uh, so, uh, uh, welcome, Marco. Thank you, thank you, Eduardo. Thanks, Eduardo. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's really a great pleasure being here. I would like to thank you uh, for having me today. Um, as, as Eduardo said, I, I, I'm gonna talk about uh, whether we are facing a crisis with our standard cosmological models, what are the components of this crisis, and, and what are the way uh, the ways out? And the first thing I want that I want to say is that, as you as you all know, we do have a standard cosmological model whose development, I think, ni nicely matches uh, our exploration of different scales in the universe. So if you just write down all the scales that you can think of. And I'm putting here as a reference the smallest scale that we can think about, which is you know, the Planck mass, where quantum gravitational effects have to become relevant. On the other hand, we have the observable horizon today, which is at the complete other opposite uh, side of the spectrum. So I like to put things in perspective, and I'm going to put myself into, uh, into this diagram. I, I would like to be slightly taller than one meter, but you know that's, that's how far it goes. Uh, we are about here at a meter, and, and this, in scales, we, we are in between, uh, mostly in between these two extreme scales. And the history, and on one side, exploring things on one side, so going to higher energy, uh, brought to the development of the standard model of particle physics and all the rich phenomenology that comes with it, while the standard cosmological model developed going the other end. And in particular, you know, when we start looking at uh, larger scales in the universe, the first thing we encounter is the solar system. And that's where we really realize that we have to start using general relativity. I mean, uh, for us on the Earth, Newtonian, Newtonian gravity works pretty well. This building was designed using Newtonian gravity. And the first time we encounter <coughs> general relativity is when we start considering things at the solar system scale, like precession of Mercury and all that stuff. Uh, the next step in this, in this ladder of scales uh, comes with observations of uh, systems of galactic size. And, and that's when we realized that we needed actually dark matter uh, to account for many things like rotation curves uh, and such. And then at the end, uh, these, these, last, uh, these last orders of magnitude, that's when we uh, discovered cosmic acceleration, the last uh, piece of the standard cosmological model that is today explained in terms of a cosmological constant. So you can, you can already see that I am a cosmologist, because this is not really up to uh, in scale, and I've dedicated far more space uh, to going to larger scales than smaller. Uh, and the reason why <coughs> cosmology is so rich in phenomenology is that during cosmic history, the, our universe explores all these, all these scales from the largest ones uh, to the smallest during inflation <coughs> going through you know, smaller scales and uh, uh, nucleosynthesis, hydrogen recombination, uh, to go to much smaller uh, energy scales today. And, and, that's what the, this, this com and that's why when we consider cosmology, our cosmological model contains all these ingredients that we have seen going outward in scales. And in fact, according to, you know, the latest measurements of the Planck satellite, uh, our universe is fairly well described by, uh, in terms of general relativity, with dark matter, and with a cosmological constant, lambda, accounting for uh, cosmic, cosmic acceleration. 
And this physical picture has been beautifully characterized by uh, 20 years of incredible observations of highly precise measurements of the cosmic <coughs> microwave background, the clustering of galaxies, their lensing patterns, and, and both their lensing patterns. Uh, and, and, the, and these observational efforts are not yet done in the sense that we are gearing up toward the next phase that's going to provide even more accurate uh, measurement of, of our universe. And perhaps, as uh, you know, th this is how every talk just a couple of years ago would go. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, as experimental sensitivity goes down and we start combining these different pieces of the information that we have about the universe, mm -hmm. we start seeing uh, cracks in the standard cosmological model. And that's what I'm going to uh, describe next. Uh, most of them rely on the fact that measurement of the cosmic microwave background from the Planck satellite are extremely precise. And they come as the power spectrum of just acoustic fluctuations in the photobaryon plasma in the primordial universe. So we, we, we are, you know, uh, we know wh what to do when we have acoustic oscillations, we just take the power spectrum. And, and this is how it looks. And surprisingly enough, this has many features. And the first thing you can measure from something that's like this, not really knowing much about it, is that you see a fundamental harmonic that repeats itself at smaller and smaller scales. Uh, and as it happens with musical instruments, the ratio at which this signal decays in frequency <coughs> is telling us something about the instrument that emitted. And in particular, it's telling us the fundamental frequency uh, at which these uh, oscillations were happening in the primordial universe. And it's not only telling us the, uh, it's telling that frequency in in absolute sense. So it's calibrating distances at recombination in, in megaparsecs. Uh, and we today have <coughs> other very precise ways of measuring distances uh, from uh, the, from, you know, local distance <coughs> ladder uh, type of measurements, uh, basically measuring the, the distance to nearby objects and through, through the, the standard Hubble road. And this program now uh, achieved uh, very high uh, precision in measuring, for example, the expansion rate today through the Hubble constant. Um, and as you can see here, uh, these are different ways of <coughs> doing the same, time, the same type of measurement of the Hubble constant. And you can see that they all more or less agree. The problem comes when we combine these two physical scales and we ask, do they agree or not? And the problem is that they don't. Uh, even if you just do, don't do any, any precise calculation, <coughs> these two different measurements are, are just different. They stay in different places. Um, and in particular, inference from the early universe, or from probes <coughs> directly coming from the early universe, the, the acoustic oscillations and, and Big Bang nucleosynthesis, disagree from direct probes <coughs> from, from late times. And in this plot in particular, this now contains also other ways of measuring the same thing, for example, strong lensing time delays that don't really share any of the systematics you know, with, with these other things. Uh, the second problem that we're facing now in cosmology is that regards the second feature of the uh, of the uh, CMB power spectrum that it's very clearly in and precisely indicated here is the amplitude of fluctuations. That's the second thing we measure, right? There is a signal and, and this signal has some amplitude. <coughs> now, since, uh, since these fluctuations in the primordial plasma seeded structure uh, in our universe and, and seeded, you know, uh, the gravitational potential wells where uh, galaxies would form, uh, we can check these measurements with direct measurements from uh, uh, galaxy surveys that are basically directly measuring how many, you know, what's, what's the, path, the clustering <coughs> pattern of, of galaxies. Uh, and, and compare those measurements uh, with predictions uh, from the Planck satellite extrapolated to late times using the Lambda CDM model. And as you can see, there, there is some sort of, uh, of disagreement between these two. Um, there is uh, l less, less statistical significance uh, with respect to the previous one, but it's, it's still there and it's something that people are really worrying about today. 
and, and uh, as you are getting the feeling, uh, this is all becoming very complicated because cosmology is, is entering this phase where we have all these different pieces of experimental evidence. And I'll just take a second to advertise one of our works, which was the first global health check of, of the Lambda CDM model. <coughs> and you're not, not, not really supposed to understand anything from this plot, as it happens when you go to the doctor, uh, right? You, you go there with all your experiments, and, and the doctor tells you, you know, that H0 is a little bit high, perhaps you should see the experts. Um, and, and we had to work a lot on the statistics of, of how to get these, uh, these things. But this is now becoming increasingly relevant because we need to understand whether all these different uh, aspects uh, do contribute uh, coherently, do have coherently with respect to our uh, standard model or not. And, and this also, uh, and this was you know, a step in, in, the, in the history, in the development history of these cosmological tensions that really gives you perspective on whether we should really worry about those or not. Because if we, if we consider just the status of these things in 2014, just five years ago, uh, five years ago, CMB measurements were, were not that so precise as plant measurements, and local measurements of the Hubble constant were not so precise. And so these things were you know, small things. Five years ago, we just didn't have sequencing surveys of, of comparable accuracy you know, that, that could be on the same plot as, as the CMB. So that there was basically nothing here. Uh, a couple, uh, well, for a, a year later, when Planck came out, uh, one of the first big uh, large state structure surveys came out. Uh, that's where, where where things started to become statistically significant. And this trend of increasing statistical significance is, is keep is, is you know keeps coming in the sense that today these things are are uh, surpassing standard you know, discovery thresholds. Uh, the Hubble constant tension now today ranges between four to six sigma, which, which uh, is enormous if you think about it, and while the weak lensing tension uh, is, a little bit, uh, is a little bit lower. And why, uh, and even if this is a little bit lower, I, I think it's very useful because it's, it's something that would allow us to explain two things at the same time. And that's where, where we, uh, where we go to, to the next problems that the standard cosmological model uh, is facing. Uh, in a sense, after uh, the, the, the a description of cosmic acceleration that was relying on the cosmological constant was very fast accepted because we had some expectations on it. Uh, when you do the exercise of writing down general relativity, the same thing gets you a cosmological constant for free that then accelerates the universe. And, but you know, that's, that's not the, the whole story. It makes sense to, to uh, ask ourselves. Now, when we, we know that general relativity is not, is not complete, it's not gonna be the end of the story. Uh, so when we are gonna update, when we're gonna discover a, a quantum theory of gravity, do we actually expect that its low energy limit uh, would be a cosmological constant? And in, in this respect, there's, there's a very interesting debate in the, in the string theory community because it was soon realized that not every consistent, consistently looking low energy uh, theory could come from string theory. You could have something that would look perfectly fine at low energy theories while it couldn't come really from, from, a, string, from a string theory. Now, after realizing that, people tried very hard to build uh, models for for lambda, for the cosmological constant. And, and here I'm just saying, I in the string theory jargon, what you really want to get is, is a de-sitter solution where you have, because that's where a cosmological constant is, is bringing us, right? If, if lambda is truly constant, then it means that, that the universe is evolving toward a fully de-sitter solution. Um, now, uh, so that, that's why it's, it's kind of important once, once, you're, once you're working on building these full theories, whether you can recover uh, lambda. And, and the, the true statement is that all attempts have, have failed and people have worked for, on this for uh, 20 years. Now to the point, they, they have failed to the point that, some, that, that part of the string theory community is today conjecturing that getting 
lambda as the low energy limit of string theory is, is, is actually impossible. And now for inflation in, in, in cosmology, for inflation that's not really a problem. We already know that inflation is not at the sitter phase, that it might be close to a, 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 an exponential expansion, but it can't be uh, exactly at the sitter expansion. The real problem is for la the, the, the lambda in lambda CDM because that would give us precisely at the sitter phase. So the, the, the consequence of these, uh, of these uh, statements in string theory is that uh, our cosmological constant can't really be uh, time independent. And I think these, uh, these, these, these two different pieces are nicely emerging now in time. These conjectures and, and these statements in string theory were, were you know, emerged like uh, during the past summer, perhaps, in, in the past year or so. <coughs> and so, and, and, and I, I think this, this should give you the idea that uh, the lambda CDM model is, is being challenged uh, on both an experimental side by these increasingly statistically significant tensions and from the theoretical side as well, um, from the theoretical side as well. So, in the in the in the reminder of of the time, I'm gonna try to uh, show you uh, what could be done uh, by trying to solve these uh, these tensions during the uh, late time of the universe and during the early times, where really the difference between these two is recombination, whether you you somehow impact uh, CMD physics or not. And I'll start fr wi with the existence of late time solutions. And uh, in, in, in that regard, I, 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 I would like to play with you a small game. Uh, when it comes to late time solutions, uh, we are already kind of prepared to face these situations because there has been 20 years of uh, research on dark energy phenomenology. So perhaps we can just, you know, capitalize on these tools to, to solve uh, these, these problems. And in this regard, in the last 20 years, order, you know, I, I, I've done this exercise of going through the archive. Order 100 models have been proposed and tested against uh, the data. Now, I personally think I contributed about 30 of these. Uh, so I, 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 I think it's, it's a pretty fair number to say. Now, if these were uncorrelated trials, then we would expect to have at least, with 100 of them, we would expect to have uh, five models detected at two sigma. And perhaps if we are just a factor three lucky, which I, I think is pretty fair, it's not an incredibly lucky, we should have one three sigma model detected at three sigma. And the, the, it's a true statement that, that there's none. Okay. None of the models that people have tested for uh, cosmic acceleration are, you know, not even barely scratching the <coughs> signal. Okay. And this is evidence, in my opinion, of two things. The first one is that we are doing correlated trials, so it's not really 100 models, it's probably a little bit less. And the second thing is that we are looking in just in the wrong direction. Now, Michael, can you? Yeah? Clarify what you mean by <coughs> sigma in this context. Oh, uh, you know, w when you detect something <coughs> at you know ninety-five percent uh, statistical significance. So, are you talking about the agreement of the model with the experiment? Yes, 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 yes. yes. So, what I mean is really that you know you, you test the model, you see if it looks if, if it works with with all the data that we have, um, and you know just brute forcing it, randomly trying models you would expect at some point to hit a lucky model. The statement is that there's no lucky model. Uh, that's, um, so, and, and that's a, a true problem uh, because uh, as, as we have seen, we have, uh, we have plenty of data power and we have questions that we need to, uh, that we need to tackle. And, and we have poor, on the other hand, we have poor theoretical guidance. So the way out from this is to start building uh, things from the bottom up. So you don't try to come up, or, or at least to, to, to cope with these problems. You don't try to come up with a model, but you try to uh, reverse engineer it. And the idea behind this is, is what 
it's basically borrowing from effective field theory techniques and, and effective field theory uh, ideas. The idea is that we just start uh, with the symmetries of the Friedman Robertson Walker. Th and this is really just a fancy way of saying that in cosmology things depend on time. So and we combine this statement with with the limit, with the low energy limit <coughs> toward large linear <coughs> cosmological scales. And as it happens when we do uh, a limiting procedure, things simplify. And things get so simple that we can write down the most general description of uh, gravitational theories and dark energy models that is just compatible with the, you know, having a universe that's homogeneous and isotropic. And perhaps, uh, and, and this data, com this, this theory compression uh, would tell you that you can characterize the space of dark energy and modified gravi and gravity models by just a bunch of functions of time. And these are just functions of time because uh, they, they are evaluated on a cosmological setup where there's only just time. And not surprisingly, the first one is just a time-dependent cosmological constant. Right in the standard lambda CDM model, this guy is time independent and fixed to a constant value. In general, it's, it acquires a time dependence. And the next step is having a time dependent gravitational constant, and that's and that's somehow not surprising as well. And then there's other technical details in the sense that you have to characterize these models, uh, perhaps introducing non-standard kinetic terms, uh, different couplings. Mm -hmm of the of the dark energy field to gravity and at last the speed uh, of gravitational waves uh, and and still we this this sounds like good progress but we are left with another problem now which is uh, we have we have to work with functions that are functions of time uh, and and uh, and in this regard it's very useful that that people have developed way of, of coping with it. Uh, and this goes, uh, there has been a lot of progress in Gaussian processes and machine learning techniques uh, to, just, uh, to just use uh, the data to extract time-dependent information. And the, the trick that does that, phys the physical trick that does that, uh, is that you can think about the space of all the functions of time is infinitely dimensional. But the space of smooth functions of time that are uh, that are varying on a slow time scale that's finite dimensional, and and this is the realization that that basically boosted the development of these technologies. <coughs> so the problem of uh, the, the the modern way of uh, of approaching the problem of estimating a function of time from the data is really how do we set the cutoff frequency for what we believe you know, is the characteristic time scale of the features that we are looking for. And, and so what we have done in the past was to uh, do this exercise and basically uh, start with a training phase, as in, as in machine learning techniques, you start with training, so you start generating modified gravity and dark energy models, and you generate many of them. Uh, and, and when we did that exercise, we, we really were uh, thinking about our prior knowledge, so we, we use no reference to the data, and you'll see in a second why that's important. Um, and after you have generated these many, many uh, models, you ask one very simple and compressed question what's the characteristic time scale? Um, and if you're really interested, it turns out that about a third of an e fold is a good number. Uh, but once you have that, uh, I, I now have to to give tribute to my collaborators in these long-standing efforts, and in particular, uh, the two uh, grad students that are going to be on the market uh, pretty soon, uh, in developing the tools, you know, you, you still have to do a lot of work uh, to go from uh, these, these type of theories down to, you know, the observational consequences and predicting the CMB and the, the, the you know, the clustering of galaxies and, and all that stuff, and, and, and that would have haven't been possible with, with all these people without all these people. Mm. But basically, after we geared up for the for the challenge, uh, this is what it is. So these are uh, all 
Uh, th these are the reconstructions of the characteristic functions that, defi that define our theories of dark energy and gravity at late times as estimated from the data. Uh, there's many interesting things in, in this plot. You can, for example, be interested in the absolute scale of our constraining power mm -hmm. as a function of time in cosmology, because nowadays uh, you know, we have tomographic information for cosmology. So the, the, these, these things hold as a function of time. And as you can see, variation in the cosmological constant at most in full generality can't really be more than 100%. That's not bad. I, I mean, it doesn't sound so exciting as an experimental constraint. It is if you think that, you know, the problems with the cosmological constant are 120 orders of magnitude uh, things, so we are doing better than that. Uh, yeah? What data were you Oh, uh, I, I should have mentioned that uh, all cosmology. So th this, is, this is just all the, the cosmological data sets that were available at the time, which means observation of the of the uh, power spectrum of the CMB, the clustering of galaxies um, from, uh, I think, the kilo degree survey at the time, supernovae measurements, measurements of baryon acoustic oscillations, and, 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 and the list goes on. Measurements of the Hubble constant, measurements of strong lens in time delays. Um, and, and, and yeah, I, I didn't really put the list because it's, it's just so long. Uh, but basically, all the all the cosmological data sets uh, that you can well, they are naturally weighted by their signal to noise. So the CMB is is you know is a big thing. You me you measure uh, scales all across. The <coughs> the I mean, yeah, the different experiments are just weighted by the intrinsic signal to noise. Oh yes, please. So how does reconstruction work when there is already internal tension between those data sets? That's, that's precisely the goal, right? I, I'm going to get to this in, in, uh, in three seconds. So this is, this is the ultimate way of reverse engineering this, right? So you have attention in the data sets, and you're really asking uh, whether you can solve it. Because, and, 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 you know, this is the most freedom you can have, right? So we'll see, that, we'll see what happens in a moment. Um, but yeah, the idea is that you know there's 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 tensions in the in the data sets that came in, and that's reflecting the tensions that I just described you. Uh, the game is really whether you can uh, whether you can uh, do that or not. But before jumping into that, I, I want to comment a little bit on on uh, on this figure because I, I think it's uh, I mean letting aside tensions for a second, <coughs> uh, this is truly all possible models of gravity and dark energy on cosmological scales as a function of time, as inferred from the data. So everything that you might find interesting, I, 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 I don't really know what you might find interesting. If you are interested in high energy physics, perhaps you, you, you see that it's a peculiar thing that the cosmological constant can flip sign, perhaps. Uh, all, all the things that are interesting and that you see, these are really the data speaking. And I find it incredible that, that you know, this is allowed by the incredible precision <coughs> of cosmological measurements that we have. And, and uh, ju just getting back to the numbers, right? We, we, we have constraints on variations of the gravitational constant, 30% uh, 30, 30 across the entire history of the universe. Uh, and on the other hand, for example, variations in the speed of gravitational waves can't really exceed 40%. And this is complementary uh, to uh, measurements at much higher energies from, uh, uh, you know, direct measurements from the, the, the timing uh, of, of gravitational waves and, and uh, light signals. So, and, and you can also quantify uh, how much you can learn uh, from these type of pictures. And, and uh, it's, it's a fancy statistical thing, but it tells you that there's basically 28 constrained mode uh, that, that are just data constrained. So that's telling you what's, what's the power and, and how much we, we actually know about gravity. <coughs> and and I, I truly think it's, it's remarkable in the sense that uh, we have reached fairly quickly a phase uh, where in cosmology we can simply afford not to be testing gravity anymore. We are not really doing blind tests. We are learning gravity directly from the data. Yeah? Just to 
her, uh, so in the previous picture, so you have all these functions, and then on top of this, you still have omega m. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, yeah, yeah. The, there's, I mean, these are quantifying uh, basically gravitation and and dark energy physics. In addition, there's there's all the things we know. Uh, so th th there's you know baryons, dark matter in this case is is supposed to be you know just dark matter. Uh, it's probably interesting in in the sense that, that if you're interested in dark matter physics, if there's <coughs> something going on with dark matter physics, that should be picked up by these, just because you can't really distinguish between some dynamical dark energy and dark matter. Effectively, they're both dark and gravitating. So, um, so that tells us that, that that's. Uh, we, we're going to get <coughs> in a second to, to what happens, you know, to, to these things. I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to say this. Now, a a as, as you were correctly saying, th there's tensions uh, between these, uh, between the experiments that we have used. So can we improve on these tensions? Is there going to be a tension uh, in these extended models? And here you see uh, what happens for the best type of reconstructions in, in, the, previous, uh, in the previous figure. And uh, what we have found is that they do help a little bit with the uh, Hubble constant in rising it from, uh, um, you know, to 71 versus 73.5. The standard lambda CDM CMB inferred value is going to be something like, like 68. So this would make about half of the tension. The tension would now be a couple of sigmas. And the reason why we can go halfway uh, is is clearly, uh, hopefully clearly shown here uh, through the supernovae uh, distance redshift relations, the residuals. Really, what's constraining these models? One of the what's constraining late time solutions to the Hubble constant is the fact that we measure supernovae. We measure many of them across an incredible range of redshifts. So, if something is is going on uh, as a function of redshift, we should see that in the supernovae. And in fact, what is, uh, if, you, um, if you are familiar with the supernovae language of the, for the Hubble constant, the Hubble constant is really a 0 0.2 magnitude thing, which is going from here to here. And you see that we are limited by the overall constraining power of supernovae measurements. Because really, the, the, the most we can do is enter here and, and go out here. We can't really, no, you know, go like something like this. I'm, s I'm sorry if I'm a bit lost here. Um, so I, th I thought sort of that your approach is you're essentially looking for <coughs> functions and you know, you're putting in various physically motivated functions. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the end, I assume would result fitting all of the data correctly. As a, so I, I guess I'm confused why you're left over with not completely fitting the supernova if your supernova was input to the models that you're trying to derive. So that, that's, that's, that, that's, the, that's, part, that's a crucial part of the technology. You want to fit the data, but you don't want to overfit the data. So, uh, so the, 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 the fact that there is, for example, a, a, a low-pass filter means that you don't allow for arbitrary variations in time that would fit all these data points correctly. Right? Uh, we, our, our theoretical prior is that physics on cosmological scales is slow, right? So, uh, and, and this is basically how fast it can go. And that's not enough to solve all the problems. That's the statement. And in particular, uh, that's I'm not sorry, so isn't, isn't that circular that you're making the statement that you do not credit as cosmologically significant any fast, you know, variations in your data? So oh, sure. having done because that, you shouldn't be upset that they don't fit that. Uh, well, y you try to fit. The, the, w the reason why you try to kill fast variations is that noise would look like a fast sure. variation. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you want to filter out what could possibly be dark energy to from what surely is noise. Right. So that's why, and, and this is the reason why I emphasize that when we built up the, the, the prior for these types of reconstruction, so when we decided what was the average time scale that we expected, we used no data. So you build up your intuition about the, the, the typical time scale that arises in models, and then you look for that. And if it's much faster, if you need something that's much faster than that, 
you just you know you, you gradually you, you, you gradually disbelieve it as 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 I think should be fairly natural. So this is this is a sort of observational no-go theorem, where where you're just saying that cosmology is slow, but can do pretty arbitrary things. I mean, these are pretty hardcore oscillations in time. Uh, they cannot be arbitrarily fast, but but you know there's enough freedom to go to have to undergo several oscillations. <coughs> you can't fully do the Hubble co constant tension, a and that's uh, I think that's a very powerful statement. Um, now, one of the things, one of the interesting things in this, uh, in this trend here is what happens at intermediate redshift here, and it's the reason why uh, these these models are partially working, and it's these oscillations that correspond uh, to the to the extra dark energy, f the evolving dark energy field. Uh, now, the goodness of the fit relies on these, on going through these. Uh, these oscillations, and that's why simpler models that you might have encountered don't really work, because they they would they they wouldn't fit in this in this range here. Uh, so that's why it's interesting to plot the two relevant time scales that we know of in the late universe and the baryon acoustic oscillations measurements. And as you see, these oscillations, the baryon acoustic oscillation measurements are, are measuring something slightly different. But as you can see here. These these oscillations are happening around the the redshift of uh, dark energy, dark matter equality, and the redshift of cosmic wh when cosmo cosmic acceleration begins. Now, this wouldn't be really that interesting if th this plot wouldn't really be that interesting if I didn't put those two time scales. But I I, I feel it's it's kind of interesting that, that this same feature is happening both in the supernovae. And on the on the BAO side, and it's contributing uh, to the way in which these these type of partial solutions to the Hubble constant tensions are actually working. So uh, this is this Sorry, is basically just, yes? just to, to confirm. So the point here is that the pink and the orange both go like this. The pink and the orange both go like this. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. And that and uh, but, but but also so uh, this yeah. is the same oscillations, right? This is the same oscillations that, that you are that you are fitting with the with the supernovae, and this you know is, is the same thing. The observable is only different, but it's, it amounts to a rescaling of time for whatever matters. But you know it's it's pretty in sync in both in both things have with the two relevant have you tried plotting the lenses, the lenses, uh, strong lens in time delays. Yeah, that's much harder because they are less. So strong lens in time delays tells you distances at a strange combination of lens shifts, so you can't make a plot that's this beautiful. Uh, <coughs> you, you would have to check, I, I, I checked the, the time delays, distances, but you know, it's, it's not that informative. You can't really plot, just plot them as a function of lens shifts. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that uh, this type of, of, of reconstructions are alleviating the Hubble constant tension, about a half of it, uh, but what they are not doing is the weak lens intensity. That's that's left mostly unchanged, and these are the two uh, these are the two limitations that we have when we try to uh, solve these type of problems at late times in the universe. We are left with inputting enormous freedom and getting out of it uh, half of the primary tension and none of the of the second tension that we have seen. So this is partially the reason why uh, we got interested in uh, trying to modify the other end. Of, of the universe to try to solve uh, to solve these type of tensions. If you can't really do it at late times, well, it might be uh, something that's happening in the early times of the universe. And when you try to do that, there's really even poorer theoretical guidance because uh, mostly no one ever dare touching too much the CMB. And, and pro possibly the reason is that you can't, when you modify physics before recombination, uh, in non-trivial ways, you can't really get away uh, from profoundly changing the inference from of, of the CMB, uh, which is very complicated and, and, and very rich, as you, as you can see here. Um, and this game just started and, and, and has provided first some first uh, results. And we started uh, mostly uh, a year ago uh, considering the effect of modifications to gravity before recombination, what would happen then? Uh, and then this, this kind of evolved in early dark energy models um, 
that were designed to address uh, the, the tension in the Hubble constant. Um, and and the, when we move to earlier times, we really need to understand what's the role of the CMB uh, that, w of th that the CMB is playing in these problems. And I think it's beautifully shown in, in this picture where we have the Hubble constant and the fundamental physical scale that the CMB is measuring, that I was telling you before. So we have local measurements of the Hubble constant, the inference of the CMB on this fundamental scale <coughs> is here, while the inference of H0 uh, on the Hubble constant really depends on the late time model, the inference of the, of, of the sound horizon only depends on the early times physics. And as you can see, the two, the two pieces of evidence that we have, the supernovae in particular, that connect these two physical scales that are in between these two calibrators uh, are, are bridging the two. So solutions in, uh, that involve changing the CMB inference of distances of the fundamental distance scale would try to move the CMB constraints from here all along the way to here, resulting in, in a higher inference of the Hubble constant and at the same time a smaller, a smaller physical scale. But as I told you, that physical scale is calibrated by the way in which the acoustic oscillations decay as a function of frequency. So as you can imagine, that's pretty hard. But nevertheless, people have found uh, a, a way to deal with it. And the, the, the strongest constraint is that uh, the, the physical scale of the, the sound horizon scale depends on the expansion history before recombination uh, in, in, in a way that you can see here. So it's peaked around the recombination and goes down in the past. But the CMB is not only measuring that. As, as you have seen, CMB measurements are rich, and in particular, uh, they are measuring <coughs> the scales at which uh, acoustic oscillations decay because of damping. Um, and, that's, and that's the damping set, that's basically the exponential envelope that you have seen, the reason why CMB fluctuations, let me show it, yeah. The reason why CMB fluctuations are just exponentially damped. There is a characteristic scales at which this damping is happening, and that's and, and its dependence on the expansion history before recombination is different. But these two scales are very well measured as well as their, uh, as their ratio by the Planck satellite. And their inference can't really be changed too much because you, you could read them off uh, the data flow list, you know, by, by eye. And the problem is uh, why some of the earlier attempts at solving the Hubble constant tensions failed, for example, uh, allowing for extra relativistic degrees of freedom in the game would change both these two time scales. You know, would they, it would change the expansion history in this way. It would change both scales in a different way, not respecting their co observationally constrained ratio. But what, what instead would preserve the ratio of these two scales is uh, uh, is a density component that is localized in time. And that's what's called, what's nowadays called early dark energy, uh, because it corresponds to an additional component that when uh, there is enough horizon sensitivity, the sound horizon sensitivity is higher, it's basically irrelevant, and then becomes relevant, interestingly enough, around the epoch of matter radiation equality, and then the case again where damping sensitive where, where the sensitivity to the damping scale becomes becomes large, eventually going to recombination. And these these models do work very fairly well uh, for the Hubble concentration. In fact, yeah. So I, I, I just want to ask a question because the, the way you phrased it here, right, I mean what what this is a fluctuation in in lambda on a very short time scale. It is. Yes. So if you had put this into your original model, you could have also put in little, you know, if you allowed for that time scale fluctuation. Oh, but uh, we'll see that. Uh, this, this, this time scale, so a as you go back, back in time, the, the Hubble scale is, is growing, so time scales become faster, right? So this is a sort of, of you know, natural time scale. This is an e-fold, right? 
Uh, oh, oh, okay. I see so it's it's, it's 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 not that bad. Okay. <laughs> okay. I I, I, uh, think. I I mean, it's it's a peak, you know, uh, intervention in energy density. There is an extra component that's that's becoming relevant around recombination, um, but it only needs this this structure here, uh, and it's it's not too fast and has very good performances in solving the Hubble constant tension in the sense that again it rises the infer the CMD inference of the Hubble constant uh, to 71. And this is just from this, not including this. Just from this, just from this, yeah, yeah. W w one, one ingredient at a time. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm gonna discuss either late time solutions or early time solutions. Um, and and uh, now, you could ask what's how natural are these are these models, and it turns out that they would be, be pretty universal in terms of scalar fields uh, that would convert the, their kinetic energy, their, their potential energy, to kinetic energy. So if you take a scalar field, um, its dynamics it's frozen by Hubble drag at early times, and that would naturally make its density contribution here irrelevant, which is what we need. Now, as time goes on, Hubble friction releases, and the, and the scalar field can start having its own dynamics and rolls down the potential, where eventually, again, as it enters the flat region of the potential, it's dumped again and just becomes irrelevant again. So somehow this, this type of models do, uh, these are the mini actually the minimal models that would give rise to this sort of uh, phenomenology. Uh, this sort of phenomenology, but really what's, what's happening is that we are changing the question from why the value of each node is the value that it has to why there is a scalar field at this point in time and, and why it's happening then. Uh, please. Uh, are you still doing 145 with the drag at the CMB time with the scalar or what? Uh, y y you so you so get it has to die. One forty-five is is Frank's uh, result. Right? Yeah. So okay. it, you you go up here. So you can mostly read it from here. It's it's gonna be one forty-three ish, something like that. Okay. In the standard model, at least as far as I know, you do the ratio of the baryons over uh, the radiation. That's square root. That means mm -hmm. like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's one forty-five. So now. Uh, you are adding something to the barrier or to the radiation. Y y you're adding you something to the. Uh, so you're adding something to the expansion history because the the baryon and photon contribution is is still weighted by the Hubble rate, mm -hmm. right? If you have the, the time with the scale factor with the scale, yeah, with the Yeah, yeah, with the scale, and and you're changing just basically how the scale factor evolves ah, before okay, recombination. And, and that, that's why it's, it's, it's changing the inference of the sound prime, uh, which is, I, I think, a non-trivial result because CMD physics is, is, is you know, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have bet that you could change, that you could have something that's 10% of energy density close to the combination, I have to say. And it dies quickly, never mind inflation and all those things, right? What? The A becomes normal for the inflation scale and all everything else. The G uh, triangulified and everything else is the same as usual. Yes. Except yes. this one over there. Ex except this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How far into this is this? Uh, I mean, uh, that, that's that's the minimal <coughs> model. The minimal model. So people have considered, for example, to have this phenomenology, have considered axion models. The the minimal model that we have studied really tells you that you have two numbers, which is why uh, you know this time and this 10%. You can't really get away wi without those two numbers, and those have to be somehow fine-tuned. Uh, well, or, or, or at least, you know, they have to enter the fit, so the data has to tune them correctly. Um, and and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have a couple of more considerations on that uh, in a second, uh, in the conclusion, basically, because um, yeah, so these are the two fine tuning the, the two fine tuning questions. Uh, but just to give some, some perspective, um, these models are very interesting because they have a rich phenomenology. And their exploitation just started in a sense. 
Um, and you can see here, these are uh, CMB residuals, these are CMB data sets, and these are the best fitting models with a higher H naught. And as you can see, there's so much detail in the data and, and that you can actually really pinpoint if you have these, um, if you have these type of deviations. And, and just think about the next generation of experiment that's going to push these error bars uh, much further down. Those would allow to make statement about the physics of what's happening at recombination uh, very precisely. And that's basically uh, the end of it. I, I, I hope I have convinced you that, that our standard cosmological model is facing a deep crisis because it's, it's being sieged from an experimental perspective and from theoretical considerations th in, in a way that never really happened uh, before. And, and experimental tensions are beyond discovery thresholds. So if you have a good model, whether that's you know, a systematic effect or new physics, you know, that, that's discovered, right? Uh, there's something in the data that we should know and we don't know. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, and, and this would exploit and has to uh, really explain an extremely rich phenomenology ranging from cosmological observables at, at many different scales from the CMB to uh, large scale structure surveys. And, and as we have seen, uh, solutions at late times partially resolve tension. That was a sweet and sour result uh, that was fairly hard to accept. Uh, you throw, so what we really have done at late times is that we have thrown the best we had. Uh, we have tested for deviations from Lambda CDM with the ultimate tools, and we have found something that was only marginally solving these problems. Um, and this resulted basically in observational no-go theorems. If somebody comes to you saying they have solved the, ten the, Hubble, the Hubble tension at, at late times, you can say only half of it can happen, you know, because that's, that's what you find when you allow for mostly infinite freedom. And early time solutions are uh, starting to gain interest from, from the community because they prove to be a viable way of, of at least alleviating these these tensions, and they are far less studied than late time solutions. So we are really far here from you know developing the the, 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 the best tools ever to, to test these models. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and on the other hand, they have a far richer phenomenology in the sense that CMB observations are uh, today very powerful and allow to really test precise statements. And the hope is that you know with great Experimental sensitivity comes, you know, uh, great, great power at concerning and discerning different, different type uh, of models. And, and the last message that I want to tell you is, is that uh, the next generation of experiments is expected to, uh, you know, say the last word on these things because it's either going to confirm the experimental evidence that we have today or, you know, just show that it's uh, it's going to be uh, a systematic. It's going to be some uh, systematic effects, and in and, and in both cases, I, I think it would be uh, very interesting. And thank you very much. everybody's bought into the constant the cosmological constant. I, I disagree that that is an accepted picture which requires a crisis if it isn't correct. I mean, observationally, since the 90s, we've mapped out a strategy which allows for the possibility of time variations as part of our experiments. And that's what people are aiming for now in the stage four things that they're setting up. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, we, we, we fortunately enough, we have kept an open mind, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but, you know, uh, Lambda is, is kind of accepted as the cosmological model. People just, you know. No, it, it's, it's a starting point, but let me we'll, we'll take this a step further. It's interesting to me that the analysis you've done is pointing to the microwave background as a place to gain some real traction on unexpected possibilities. 
you said conversely, you know, you cannot, in any of your work, explain the current of attention. I've asked that question a different way, is with the sensitivity of the functionals that you've put in, can you map out a very sharp strategy for testing in the near term, say, do this instead of what we're doing now, measure it this way, measure it this epic, yep. and you devise a maximum sensitivity to things you're looking yeah. for in near time. That, that, that's, that's, that's absolutely interesting. Uh, I mean, we have just started doing these things, especially the reconstructions. Uh, that's fairly recent. Uh, we definitely want to you know, understand whether what's the best approach uh, to constrain them. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do, but uh, it's going to be <coughs> in, in the future. Because you know, it's we're basically the first step in, in that direction. We're spending a lot of money on stage four you know, experiments, and so if there's guidance to be had, th that would be extremely yes, useful. Yes, uh, absolutely. absolutely. That's, that's, I think we're going to do it at, at some point. Favorite field of yours is the physical field that has genetic mm -hmm. and uh, potential, presumably, yes. therefore, is the, the physical. And you get this physical thing from Frank DP type thing model, uh, where you have a scalar that is only alive for a very short yeah. region of uh, D4 X. Or uh, like it, it's, it's a good point. Uh, this just started. So I mean, literally, this is the first thing that people tested. Uh, now, now, we'll probably try to see uh, how that arises in more, in more complicated models. In, in brass dickey type of models, you basically have you know, some dynamics that are coming from variations in Newton's constant. At yeah, I mean, there's much more than that, yeah. And large brass dickey that has all kind of other things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in yeah. for example, you know, that's not a scalar one that we have, but it's too early. But yeah. Yeah, place that you chose for this scalar to, to really manifest itself is at the equilibrium between matter and uh, yeah. radiation. Yeah, so w one of the things why... There's a lot of physics over here that you have to worry where this is, pops up from where this kind of scale. Uh, exactly. So one, one of the things, for example, why Brasdicki type models are, are interesting is that uh, the, the feature that these things pop up at matter radiation equality uh, you might try to explain one of the tunings by, you know, by making the scalar field somehow sensitive to what's happening to matter. And a way of, of doing that is, is, you know, coupling through the gravitational constant that would, that would know what, what the value of matter density is, right? A single scalar field doesn't really know that, and you have to tune it. I mean, you have to decide that the height of the potential give, is giving you the precise energy density. But at this equilibrium, the, 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 the red shift is about 3,000 something. That I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Now suppose you write your theory for red shift 4,000. Oh, then you wouldn't do the, the Hubble constant. That's, that's interesting in the sense that, uh, as you see, the, the sensitivity of the CMB fundamental scales decays in time. So if I start modifying, you know, things here, the, the CMB, I mean, th these are earlier and earlier times, right? Uh -huh. This is 10 to the 3, this is 10 to the 4 regression, oh, okay. right? If I have something happening over here, you know, here, the sensitivity to the, to the CMB of the CMB is very low. So I would really need to modify things pretty harshly, you know, to, to fix the Hubble constant tension. Uh, and then at some point you run into, into nuclear synthesis. <coughs> uh, so here, in, in this scale, I think, one, two, three, four, you're here. Uh, What's the temperature, 9,000 something at that uh, range? 9,000 K, roughly? At the equilibrium? In, in uh, at which time, at nuclear synthesis? At the equilibrium, matter and... Uh, matter radiation must be, I don't uh, I think, 9,000 something. Not sure, but yeah. it's, it's 3,000 in recombination, yeah, exactly. but that's not okay, quite the same thing. Yeah. It's a border in the So it's going to be yeah. like, so 300K is a 40. Yeah, about 40. And his scalar comes at that temperature. Yeah. I mean, there's there's many unsolved questions in, in this type of, of model building. Um, 
But you know, I I this just started as, as a phenomenological uh, exercise. In a sense, we are trying to see what we can do to fix these to fix these problems. Um, yeah, and so then. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was trying to understand these early type solutions. So you're not fortifying gravity. This is general relativity. Mm -hmm. Do you still assume that you have a topological constant, and you just on top of that add a scalar field? Yeah. To see, okay. So and it's a minimally yeah. coupled scalar field with just a very specific potential. Yeah. The the the, the, the minimal model is just you, you can't get away without lambda. Right. Uh, be because you know, lambda is happening here. I mean, you, you still have to have, you know, a, a good late times universe, and and, and you need lambda for that in this type of model. But is it time dependent lambda? Uh, in in this case, no. It's just assuming this is lambda. The other uh -huh. on, on on the other in, in the other strategy, we were doing time dependent time lambda. Uh, you you could combine the two things, but it feels like you know, too much complication. Uh, you want to write the action? This in well, the except, except that, I mean, it, it, it's too much complication, except that that if you ask just the late time to do it, you don't really move the, the growth stuff, right? And yes. so I think it, there, there's still an interesting question, which is that if, you know, I mean, right, so, 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 so from my perspective, right, I think it's perfectly possible that, that, you know, there's actually two Nobel Prizes to be had rather than one, right? There's two fixes to be had. Yeah. Uh, and so if that's the case, then, then uh, uh, you know, there's something interesting to see. In your effective field theory approach, right, can you solve, can, can you solve the growth if you've already solved the, the Hubble constant with, with early universe physics? Yeah. And I, I'm not, it's and not I'm obvious to me. It, it, it's not, no, not obvious to me either uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, I mean, the the um, it, it has to be uh, somehow allowed by the things that you have seen, uh, but if you if you remove the Hubble constant tension from from that equation, then pro possibly things can readjust a little bit right. to try to go um, to go. A and in and in that respect, it's important to have you know probes of of the, the, the growth of structures uh, because it it could point to you know two different problems. Or it could be used as to, to, to cross check. You come up with one solution, hopefully, and you know that explains why you have you have the weak tension tension. And and, and, and I think you know uh, uh, to to respond to your comment, perhaps there's more things to see. Uh, I'll just go back to the first slide where you have the energy scales, right? There's so many. Uh, th th there's one. I'll, I'll do it from here. There's so. Where's that? It's, it's, it's amazing if you think about the richness of phenomenology that we have here, right? So whether there's going to be more discoveries to be made in, in, this, in these sectors, uh, the answer is, is why not? Why should physics be at all different and less rich in this regime uh, and, and so rich in, in, this, in this range? Please. So Please. you know that I'm super excited with this really dark energy model. There's two two things that are that still it bothers me a lot. So first, that there's this item that you have three components that there's no talk between radiation, cold dark matter, and a field of field, and somehow they all become relevant in the same gravitational plane, the same field plane. And the second is that allowing our model, like these components, you know, to be relevant to the energy density and decay in a single epoch could open a can of worms that, you know, like we have one e-fold since cosmic acceleration, there's one e-fold be between the peak of CMB lensing and optical lensing, so if you allow things to vary, uh, you know, and disappear, like <laughs> relevant and disappear in a scale of one e-fold, uh, there's, uh, there's many e-folds, there's, there's many the there's there's combination, yeah. it, 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 it can be, be, you know. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I agree. Um, I mean, these are these are not models that, in my opinion, are designed to be natural somehow. I, I think we'll get naturalness next. Uh, I mean, on, on one hand, many things are not natural, for example, in the standard model. Uh, but you know, if if you get six sigma to somebody and ask to motivate this, I, I think we can probably do that. Uh, 
and, 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 and this then adds to that model that like becomes increasingly more important at higher redshift, even if it contributes, even if RS dies out at high redshift, <coughs> we get an increasing contribution, you know, at higher redshift that such doesn't make that fine tune in terms of the location. The, the, and the somehow, you, and then you worry like how to fix BBM, because that, that's a point that's like three decades away. Uh, the, the problem is the ratio between the two, right? If you keep increasing this way, you're gonna change the sun price on more than the dumping scale. And the ratio, and, and you can't really change the ratio of the two because it's really just something that's living here, right? The ratio between this scale and this scale, and, and you know, the scale of the decay, it's, it's something that you can read off this plot. And you know, it's, it's, it's tight, it, it can't really be, its inference can't really be changed. So the, the risk of, of having changes that extend in the past is that you spoil the relationship between the and pieces there's of no, the scale. There's no way that we can readjust this. Like long as there, we know that there's no way that we can readjust this. But let me let me jump in for a second because because we're 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 okay. getting past the time by, by for a bit. So so uh, let me suggest that that uh, two things. So one, if you are interested in coming to dinner. Uh, uh, Tim is uh, is helping organize that, so 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 please ping Tim. Uh, Tim, can you raise your hand so people know who you are? I think I'm, uh, anyway. So there's Tim. Uh, so that's point number one, and point number two. Let's just thank thank uh, Marco one more time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm